Hi, and welcome to another edition of Speak Up Presents. Tonight we're going to be talking about ex-felon uh, reentry issues, felon reentry issues. And we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Sarah Romeo, who's the, is it executive director, is that the title yes. you use? Yes. Executive director at Tampa Crossroads. Welcome, Sarah. I'm glad you could be with us tonight. Uh, we have Josette Ursa, Urso. Castello. Ooh. Castillo. Oh, actually. we have the wrong name yes. here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Well, Josette, uh, and you're a graduate of the women's program mm -hmm. at Tampa Crossroads. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to Thank you, and I'm glad you could be with us. And Al Elaine Terenzi, who is uh, the chief U.S. probation officer for the Middle District Court, the District of Florida. Welcome, Elaine. Thanks for coming and being Thank with us. Thank you for inviting us. Why don't we tell everybody first about your two agencies and uh, what they do and uh, why we need to know about them. Sarah. Well, I'm uh, with Tampa Crossroads, and we have been uh, providing services to ex-felons here in Hillsborough County for 29 years now, almost 30. Uh, we are really um, in the business of helping people re-enter into the community, coming out of jails and prisons, helping them go through residential facilities where they can get uh, rehabilitation for uh, maybe drug and alcohol, uh, perhaps just uh, mental health issues, but uh, also helping them find jobs and just re-enter into our community successfully. And you're operating residential and non-residential or just yes. resident, resident? No, we do residential uh, for women and uh, in Pinellas County we have residential for men and women. And we also do non-residential services of um, just counseling, uh, aftercare services, helping them find jobs, locate uh, living uh, places that, you know, a lot of people won't let you move into a particular apartment if you have any type of record. Uh, so we, we help them with whatever needs they might have. And what kind of records could they have had or, or who enter your program? Could it be anything at all? Uh, we particularly uh, deal with nonviolent felons, so most of the people we deal with may have uh, drug charges, they may have some um, petty crimes resulting from uh, alcohol use, they may just have committed a number of petty crimes, they may have been uh, convicted of prostitution more than two or three times. So it's a, it's a pretty wide range, but they are nonviolent. Is it still, and I should probably uh, disclose that I was on the board for a number yes. of years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and things may be different because it's been quite a while, and that's why I'm making sure I act like a viewer and ask every question. <laughs> um, but uh, with the program, there, folks or women are housed longer than men, correct? Well, not any longer. There's been a few changes. There was at one time a men's transitional that just sort of got them through, had a safe place to stay until they could get jobs and get a little money to get on their feet. Uh, now the women's program is six months and there's six months of aftercare. Uh, the program that we operate in Pinellas County, which is for uh, NGI, which is not guilty by reason of insanity, that's a, a different population, but they are also coming back into the community now, and that's a one-year program. So, and so, so they have support that whole period of time. How did they get in? Is it because a judge has suggested the program? Or they, can they come directly to you? Because I, I, as I recollect, it used to be a judge might, uh, might recommend the program to a particular person. Many of our um, clients come to us that are court ordered. Uh, we have a new program now through the Drug Dependency Court where, again, they're court ordered, but they have to volunteer for the program. And then the judge will commit them to enter and complete. But we also started a couple of years ago a self-pay program, and that's for individuals who realize they need help and may or may not have um, trouble with the law, so to speak, so they can come in on their own uh, after they're assessed by our clinicians and determined to be eligible for our program. They can come in without having been arrested prior? Yes, yes. Oh, that's something yes. new. Some of and the, the services, remind me about the services you're providing in the women's program. And, um, well, and also in the program, in the other programs, but uh, there's, there's, the, uh, there's drug programs going on, like an AA, correct? Uh, we're not too much AA, NA based. We're a non-disease model. We believe that people who are using drugs don't actually have a disease. We believe it's a choice. So we actually help them develop life skills. 
which is uh, number one, employment. Everyone who enters our program within the second month has to be employed full time. And as they continue to go out every day and work, they come back to the program at night and stay there. Uh, for the most part, they're on probation and or community control. And they have, they have uh, classes and groups all day. They have one-on-one -on -one counseling. They're group counseling. Uh, they, we now have added art therapy to our program as an expression. A lot of uh, women who have um, particularly violent past, I think Josette could probably speak to this, are, don't really know how to express themselves. And we've found that through art, a lot of the women are, are able to talk about and, and show what their feelings are. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, parenting classes. We have dress for success classes. Uh, we have classes on current events. These are uh, ladies who have really not had a good strong basis like you and I probably have had. Some of our women uh, have never had money to handle. They've never had bank accounts. So we have volunteers that come out and show them actually how to do budgets and how to uh, how to work at a, a fairly low paying job and, and be able to pay your rent and to uh, keep food in the house. We have cooking classes for them. As I, as I recollect, um, when, I, when I was on the board of Crossroads, the recidivism rate of someone who didn't come through Crossroads was significantly high. Like yes. if you went to jail once, you had maybe an 85% chance yes. that you were going again. It is that high still. Is it? Yes. Um, and how about Crossroads? Are, have, are they still keeping a lower rate of people ever yes. going back to I jail? I think recidivism right now, the last time I saw the numbers on it, was somewhere around 25%. That's fabulous. It is. I, it, you know, we, we didn't get 100%, but if you consider 75% <clears throat> of the people who have been to jail not going back again, that, that is a, a, huge, uh, a huge accomplishment for our entire community. It really is. Elaine, tell me about uh, what you do and what's involved at the U.S. Probation Office. Well, I'm the Chief United States Probation Officer um, for the Middle District of Florida, which covers the area from Jacksonville down to Naples. So it's a, a fairly large area. Um, in Tampa, uh, we have about a staff of 70 across the district. We supervise 3,600 people uh, who were released, mostly released from prison on supervised release. We also These are people with federal charges. Federal charges. And, and what you're handling at Crossroads is not, right? Or could, could it be? It Did could you know? be. We, we have, have crossed lines a little. We have you used do. Crossroads services. Mostly it's services. local courts, though, or state or uh, criminal. Is that correct? Yes. Um, most of the people coming into our program locally are from the local courts, mm -hmm. but a lot of them have have already been to uh, that side already, or maybe you know they've uh, made another misstep. And it's uh, but we we mostly deal with the local counties. And we have okay. referred some people to Crossroads. So the charges well. are going to be different in some well, way, or different in some ways, but are... not entirely. Uh, drugs is one that. Mm -hmm that cuts across both the state and the federal jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps on the federal side, it may be more trafficking uh, and less simple possession. Um, but it is still drug-related. And 40 to 50 percent of the felony cases that are prosecuted federally uh, involve some kind of drugs, cocaine, um, heroin, methamphetamine. 50 percent of all, is that what you just said? Yes, across the country. Of all cases have to do with drugs. Wow. It's a tremendous, tremendous amount. Uh, so we also handle the pre-sentencing reports and the investigations for the courts prior to the sentencing. And then we handle the supervised releasees uh, when they could come out of jail, uh, as well as some of the probation cases. Although the majority of our cases are supervised releasees, uh, felons who are being released from prison. What does that mean exactly, supervised releasees? They have to report in? Um, well, when the law changed, um, it used to be called parole. Okay, they and don't call that, that they, anymore? They, no, because there is no more parole on the federal system. Um, is there parole on the locals? In the local no, parties? I don't think so. Not in, not not in the really state of Florida. So. Oh, parole's or a bad probation. word now? <laughs> well, parole yeah. it had in, in it was the idea of an early release, so that during the time when there was parole, um, an offender might have served about 60 to 65 percent of his sentence. 
now, on the federal level at least, the person who's incarcerated actually com completes 88% of their sentence before they're released. This is a federal requirement? Yes. And on so the local level, no what's the percentage there? So there's no early release anymore. Is it still, the, is it, did that go up too? Um, yeah, on the local level it also went up, and I think it is locally about 75% of the sentence has to be completed. Okay. Well, right. and you add to that the uh, mandatory minimum sentences that apply mm -hmm. to the drug offenses um, and to many of the other offenses. People are now spending more time in jail than they had in the past, say a decade ago or two decades ago. Uh, in the Middle District of Florida, the average sentence is about 78 months, which is a fairly significant sentence, with some being uh, obviously seven at the years higher end. And so many. Mm -hmm. so seven years and a couple of months. It's a significant amount of time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so now, that's so, a bad. So, so they're away that long before they're going to come back out. And 10 years ago, what would have been the five years, four years, something like that, and now it's a, is it, is it making a difference that we're making these sentences longer? Do you know? Does anybody know this? Uh, uh, there, has been a, I mean, there has been a reduction in, um, in violent crime in, in terms of the statistics, if you look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's this particular factor that's making a difference or, or some other factor. And there are many other factors. We were talking on a show we did uh, recently, last week, we did a show on uh, women's issues, and uh, uh, the, the fact came up of uh, what it says in a book called Freakonomics, which it's possible that the lower violent crime rate has everything to do with abortion being legal 20 years ago, you know, which is stated in there. I mean, there's all these other things, so that, so that maybe an unwanted child uh, may have uh, escaped uh, uh, becoming a criminal or something. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, so in the, in the monitoring of the people on probation, what goes on? Well, when we have uh, people coming out, obviously we have a, there are a lot of issues. We start before the person is released, uh, going to the home, speaking to the family, trying to prepare the family for the person's release. Seventy um, people working on what did you say? Thirty six hundred? Oh no 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 no! That's oh, just in, the, in in Tampa. The caseloads range depending on the kind of cases from anywhere from thirty for high risk cases to about sixty to sixty five um, per officer. Uh, for per officer. Per wow. officer. It's a huge caseload. That's load. a big huge case caseload. Load, yeah. That's enormous. Especially when you're Do looking at the Do you have to handle area. 60 people in mm -hmm. a month, each month about? Is that what well, you mean? Well, it, de it depends on the individual. What we do is we put together an individualized plan for that person okay. um, as they come out. Some people's needs are greater than other people's needs. Um, and we try to evaluate their strengths, their needs, and the risks that they present. Look at the sentence that, that has been imposed because a lot of the conditions are to be served after they're released, for example, mm -hmm. fines and restitutions and maybe drug treatment, perhaps uh, community control, as mm -hmm. you would call it in the state, or a home confinement component to it. So we look at all of that and then um, determine a plan for that individual. So it may be that the person is seen very often, depending on the needs and the risks that the, that the offender presents, and it may be that someone else who don't, does not present the same level of risk might be seen less often. So it's a balancing act. But even though it's a balancing act, it is always busy. It is always a tremendous amount of work. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we utilize contractors out in the community to help because it is too much work for an officer to do. Um, we have about 40% of the people that we, um, that we supervise have drug and alcohol or mental health issues and are in some kind of a treatment program. Um, and we have contractors throughout the area that we uh, that we partner with uh, to do. Can you name some of those? Some of the individual contractors? Or some of the drug and rehab places that are used. Or if you go on our website. I did see that. <laughs> we, I, I we, did notice. One I of the things that we did do uh, for our offenders is we went back and we surveyed them. We asked them, tell us what you need. What are your top concerns as you first come out? 
and uh, got back some interesting information. We would have assumed that it would have been drug and alcohol treatment. Um, sometimes they don't realize their needs as, in those areas as perhaps as, as closely as we do. But medical was a big issue. Dental was a big issue. Obviously, employment was a big issue. And then what we did was we took those needs, we looked for services in the community, and we put together what you saw on the website, which is a map of the Middle District of Florida. Click on a county, and it'll go through in each of those areas, medical, dental, where somebody can look uh, for community-based services well, to help. On your website, uh, can you repeat it, though? Uh, it's a pretty easy one, www.usprobation.com. Okay. And Tampa Crossroads dot com. com? It's yes. dot com? Yes. Well, okay. We we'll use the dot the, com, we'll even though it's yeah. not a com, because most people remember com. Right. Dot gov. You're on speak up. Yes. I, I, uh, I agree with the woman to the was a dark brown quarter rate. But uh, the bottom line is, I never heard once say Jesus Christ. I mean, these people are making money off uh, mental illness, you know, drinking. I've been drinking. Don't get me wrong, but they never said. She, I heard her say once about Jesus Christ. That man can do delivery for everything. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I think that that's, that caller um, really does show why we need to have different kinds of, of treatment programs and treatment modalities for different people. Some are reached with religion, with religion, Some and the AA. Yeah programs and, and some of the faith-based programs work really well for them. Others are turned off by turned that. Off by that. Yeah. And so while it may be important uh, to some people, it's not to everybody. You have to find the right yeah, It's got to be right a good thing. match. And apparently this fellow felt that that was the right thing for him. Uh, okay, so um, you've, you've, you've created these partnerships. What are, and, and they've told you what some of the problems are. You named what they all are. It's, pretty big is that the same same thing that you're seeing well besides the fact that you you don't talk about support in yours where you're talking about the additional element of here's here's some support you got more friends and so forth maybe Josette so tell me what's good about having a program like Crossroads or tell me your experience uh, with with being in prison and coming out and going through well um, I went to prison in 1995 I spent two years of my life in prison and when I came home did go for a while, but I was probably more angry and had even greater issues than before I went in. Mm -hmm. What led me to Crossroads years later was just um, bad choices, constantly making bad choices, putting myself before anyone and wanting what I wanted. And Crossroads, they, it changed my life, my entire way of thinking. Um, it taught me to be, they taught me to be a better person, how to deal with issues. Um, how to respect other people, and it just basically, it, I couldn't have done it without them. That's, I mean, if I would have gone back to prison because I was on my way, and I basically pled to the judge, and, you know, I, my whole life story came out at that point, and I looked at the judge, and I said, please, I need some help. You know, I'm not a bad person. I was using drugs. I hated the person that I was. Mm -hmm. And going through Crossroads and being given that chance and that opportunity, I care about myself now, and I have respect for myself, and I have respect for other people, and I've made great strides, and solely through to Crossroads <coughs> and the people that I met through Crossroads and what I was taught. What are some of those things? What, what do you, if you gave, if you were talking to a viewer that might have been in your place, and and they haven't come to Crossroads or anything else yet, and they needed some help, what what was? More, so much value to you? Me, um, they gave me hope. My counselors, they gave me hope. They, they believed in me and I didn't believe in myself. They gave me the strength and the support until I could stand on my own and constantly let me know that I could do it, that I could get through this, that I wasn't alone. And I needed to hear that. Positive encouragement that you had. Constant. Okay. Constant. And are you, w w did they help you with uh, job finding or employment, uh, no, employment issues, well, or did you find? We go through interviewing tips and things like that, but no, basically you're out on your own. Okay. You're out on your own, and you have your job search list, and you have to buy by every day, go out for so many hours, and 
make your contacts. I did, um, through my counselor, meet a wonderful employer that I'm with now. Tomorrow will actually be one year that I've been with him, and he's in a, just a blessing. I have met so many wonderful people through the Crossroads program, the most selfless, caring people that have come you know, towards my path, and I'm very, very thankful and grateful for all of them. If you, if you went back, and the show's title is uh, Felon uh, Reentry Issues, what, what, when you came out the, the first time, is that the mm -hmm. first time? And the second time was when you got into Crossroads, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first time, you, you then came across these reentry issues or the ability to, 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 to make something different happen. What, what do you think were the big ones for you? That I avoided? Why well, did I stay in that some situation? Some of the things that are, yeah, so hard for you to like make a change in your life. Was it because of the experience in prison itself? The, prison, the, the experience on the outside? What? I think it was just um, everything, all of the factors from growing up and feeling useless and not being happy with myself and not striving for better. Um, just not knowing how to deal with issues, not, not wanting a good job, not looking at my future, just thinking about right now, turn to alcohol, using drugs, just caring about that moment in time and making myself feel better for that moment in time instead of looking at the big picture and continuously breaking the law, no regard for the law, just did what I wanted to do, what made me happy. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what, what other things do you see that are issues? You mentioned these four major ones. Um, and, and I think during the, before the sh show started, I asked you what's a big one, and you talked about the fact that so many people are coming out of, will be coming out of prison who are? Elderly. Yeah. Elderly people being released now after serving fairly long sentences, and, and in some cases, the majority of their lives they've been incarcerated, and they're coming out now with a myriad of problems. I mean, you can't, you can't be locked up for 30 years and come back into a community we're looking at things so basic as people that don't even know how to use cell phones. They have no clue about computers. They, they went, as I said earlier, to jail or prison with a drug or alcohol problem. And even though they haven't drank or done drugs since they've been incarcerated, they have those same problems, the problems that drove them to that to begin with. So mental health issues, health issues in general, I, there's, from what I hear, there's not really great health care in the prison system. Uh, education is huge. They they don't have skills. Um, we Why have. Why don't we require that in jail? Well, I mean, it's we sad. require you to exercise so many, to, or get up at this time. Is well, that is that correct? You have to get, get up here. And lights are out at then. What if you had to study? I mean, did anybody ever think of that, or is that too much? Well, nationally, it, it right help. now, we spend forty one percent more on incarcerating people than we do on educating them. And the programs that, rehabilitation programs that some prisons do have are very underfunded. So we're getting calls from people, we're, I get calls from probation officers all over the state of Florida. The, the hardest one right now, particularly in our state, with all of the uh, terrible things that happened here in the last couple of years, is um, we constantly get calls for sex offenders being released. They have served their sentence, and they're going to be released somewhere, but where? There's no housing. There's That's, no jobs for them. It's a huge, huge problem. I really want to talk to you about that because we even faced it here at the, at the station, that issue. Uh, I think it's a really big one, and I know Crossroads has had to handle it and gotten press off it and all that kind of thing. But we're going to take a break. We'll be back in, in just a minute. <laughs> You know because they die. Can you handle the truth?
Running time! Hi, I'm Louise from Sesame Street. <laughs> you are your child's first teacher, so make physical activity and eating right part of your routine. Not only will you feel great, but it'll make it easier for your children to stay healthy as they grow older. Dance time! It's the small steps you take to make a real difference for you and your children. Oh, does Louise know what time it is now? What time is it? No! Can I help you, sir? Oh, I found these over by the stairs. Love handles. Lots of people lose them taking the stairs instead of the escalator. Thank you. <laughs> we're back and we're talking about uh, felon reentry issues with Sarah Romeo, Josette, and with Elaine Terenzi. Since I've lost your last name, we'll just leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we were talking before the break about sexual predator. First of all, a lot of people don't know that, that these definitions. Could you do that? Because I think that's a confusion. Sexual offender. Mm -hmm. You could be a sexual offender and not rape anybody, right? Absolutely. You Absolutely. could have downloaded some porn from your computer, and you are now a sexual mm -hmm. offender. Is that correct? Yes. Well, uh, only if you're arrested. <laughs> Only if you're arrested. <laughs> well, downloading child pornography. Right. Only child pornography. Child pornography. Child pornography. It's not illegal, as far as I know, to download adult pornography. But child pornography, it is yes. illegal. And if someone is arrested doing that, um, that They're makes classified. them as a sexual offender. Now, sexual who offender. else is classified as a sexual offender? Well, you could have rapist? a case of an of a, uh, 18-year-old young man dating a 14-year-old girl. Or 16. Uh, We've had uh, cases like that that have come through our agency where the two were dating for several years with full knowledge of everybody. The kid was at the Christmas table, and one thing or another would happen in the family, and it would blow up, and then the father reported the son for dating his daughter, and the 18-year-old uh, now has a uh, label for life. Okay, that's, that's one way, because mm -hmm. the, they were uh, over the... The age. Legal age, mm -hmm. and, right. the, and the girl or the, the girl partner was, was under the legal age. Right. What's another way that you get classified as a sexual offender? Well, okay. Rape, child molestation uh, Well, charges. child molest molestation, I think, is going to move to a much heavier um, predator-type crime. Uh, you know, there, there are some really narrow uh, interpretations. The predator of was it. twice an offender. No, it's Even not. If it, it, it's a designation. Yeah. It's really a legal definition, yeah. and there's a designation by a state uh, judge that the person right. meets the criteria predator. for okay. a predator. Now, so now we, all right, we, so we somewhat defined it. And now they've gone to prison, and they're coming out, and they want to start their lives they again. And what somewhere. happens? Uh, well, it's very, very difficult for them to find a place to live. There are a lot of restrictions, obviously, of, uh, you know, where they can and can't live. And I think they're pretty much all on probation, too. Um, there are so many rules and laws right now in place that they can barely find a place to live. They're, they're doing things now that are sort of creative, where there's a motel somewhere on the far east part of our county here uh, that they've basically shut down as a retail motel, I should say, and it's housing uh, sexual offenders. It's very, very difficult. We actually don't accept them into our program. I don't know too many treatment providers in the area that uh, work with them, to be quite honest. It is. You used to have them in the program. I think they did Oh, years I know ago. you did. I helped with press on it once. Yeah. Uh, hold on a minute. Uh, you're on speaker. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about your art therapy program. Um, I just tuned in, so I wasn't sure if you talked about this at all during the program, but can you tell me a little bit about it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we have uh, one of the classes, or I guess courses you could say, at our women's program here in Tampa is art therapy. Uh, we have a, a young lady, a counselor, who is a master's level and specializes in the art therapy. Uh, what we found through a lot of research and data and by having um, our clinical person bring this to us was that a lot of people find it a little difficult to express their emotions or talk about things that might have happened that were weighing heavily on them. 
and through drawing, painting, uh, they do ceramics, they're able to express um, maybe what's bothering them. Uh, I, I remember particularly, and some of this is on our website, but I remember particularly a young woman who made her living on Nebraska Avenue, had a lot of drug and alcohol problems, drew a picture of Nebraska Avenue and sort of a, a monster, and that was, that was the monster to her was that avenue, and that's the only way she could express it to our counselor. Um, we do have quite a bit of artwork on our website uh, that was done by our clients, and uh, it's a very interesting uh, theory now of, of helping people express their emotions and sort of get through that barrier mm -hmm. and heal. You, uh, in the U.S. Probation Office, you don't have um, uh, people on probation who've committed sex offenses. Oh, do yes, you? we do. Is that because of... Uh, we spend a lot of our resources <coughs> actually um, supervising that population. Earlier, you had mentioned downloading child pornography and, and the idea that perhaps that's not such a dangerous activity. However, the research that's coming out of the federal prisons, mostly because a lot of that has been federal, um, is that many, if, if not most, uh, of the people who have been convicted of, of that uh, have previous contact offenses in their history. So, you know, the idea that perhaps, well, it's just looking at pornography so that, that it's... Maybe uh, less it's, harmful. It's less harmful. Well, it, it really seems are very, like that would be less harmful than if than you a contact, touched a child. Than a, a child contact sex less. offender. However, the, the research is, is so, so strongly linked. That one linked. will lead to the other or that it's well, probably more than likely that... The person who's doing that is also a, a molester. Well, it's hard when you're looking at a correlation to decide which, which came first, which, mm -hmm. which right. came Chicken later. Egg. However, in looking at that population, the population that is in the sex offender treatment program in, for example, Butner, uh, which is the federal um, prison that houses many of them, um, the number of contact sex offenses that they've committed um, that was known at the time that they were sentenced and those that were known after they've completed a very strenuous uh, treatment program which include po you know, polygraph uh, and kind of confrontational group therapy. It's pretty amazing how many uh, contact offenses that, that they have had in their history. So that when we see someone has been convicted of uh, possessing child pornography, especially if it's been a lot of child pornography where it's, it, it, it is clearly preferential. Uh, you're dealing with a pretty dangerous person and you have to supervise them as if they're dangerous. It is on many of these issues. There is two sides to it. While it makes it very difficult and we have to supervise the sex offenders they come out and it is difficult for them to find housing. It is also understandable why um, those laws that create these civil disabilities were put in place. Um, it's always a balancing act. It's very, very difficult. Even on some of the, uh, with sex offenders, it's pretty clear that, yeah. that we have our most vulnerable citizens, our children, that need to be protected from some of our highest risk offenders. And I think mm -hmm. that's a place where reasonable people can find a lot of, of, of common ground. Mm -hmm. However, if somebody's been convicted of possessing child pornography, they're not going to be in jail forever. They are going to reenter into the community. Um, and they do need housing, they do need to be supervised, they do need services, and helping them to re-enter successfully is also important for the safety of our children. So it kind of it works both ways. You see it also with the uh, drug offenders as they come out and um, if they're affluent enough to have middle income or upper income family members, they can rejoin their family members. If, however, their family members live in public housing, they could jeopardize the public housing well, of their mother there, right? Right. or their mother or and their that's spouse. Reason, that's reason too, and, yeah. and that's another kind of a disability. You can still understand it. We want to keep public housing safe from yeah. drug dealers and drug traffickers. Uh, but in the process of doing that also, we're creating these other barriers um, and that, that, person, are, that create challenges for offenders yeah, as they Now, come that out. person could be the person uh, Sarah described before, too, who was uh, maybe uh, three or four years older than his girlfriend, too. 
We don't see on the federal side. I don't. I've never seen a case but like that's that. But they could state, still. They and they still come out. Those people come out, and and what I think the big difference is too. If you have a a family member that goes to prison or to jail for a sex crime versus a drug crime or something nonviolent, the one group is going to have family support when they come out typically. The other one, even the family is going to say, no, they can't live here, or they have other children still in the home, or they, you know, you're not going to get that same level of support anywhere across the board. Uh, hiring someone who has a drug conviction to work for you is not going to be a problem, but hiring someone who has a sex crime to work for you is going to be a serious issue. Um, is this treated the same way in other countries? Do you know? I'm not sure. Uh, downloading child pornography? No, I mean, Some countries. Just, just folks who, who've gotten uh, convicted of, uh, you know, of those kinds of crimes. Are they treated the same way? In other words, we we now, I mean, my phone, uh, I'll get one of those uh, automatic telephone calls uh, from the police oh, right. department. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten, I don't know, one a year maybe, um, and, uh, you know, suggesting someone's moved into the neighborhood, right. give us some warning. Might be up to, gosh, maybe a mile or two away, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't know what the distance is, but they're not around the corner. Um, and it'll say, you know, so-and-so's there, and uh, they've been released. There'll be a, 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 a pre-recorded message, and I'll have that on my voicemail. And I just wonder, do other people get that or or not. I, in, in other I've countries, are we doing this? I don't know if they do it in other countries. I have a feeling I mean, in other countries... I mean, this is countries, not something we, we used to do. Well, some crimes in other countries, they don't go to prison for. They just chop their heads off right there. So, you know, That's they don't have to worry true. about, they don't That's have to worry true. about re-entry. This but. is true, too. <laughs> You're on Speak Up. Well, good evening, ladies. Well, hello, Miss Smith. And there is Sarah Romeo, too. Anyway, yeah. here's the deal. Good I evening, Marilyn. I've been watching this, um, seem to catch on quite nicely with these youth ministers. There seems to be a youth minister in, on every corner church and in the middle of the block, but they are also been found a lot lately, it appears to me, to be abusing their own flock. Now, with that in mind, once they're convicted, are they allowed to come into Crossroads? And, you know, that poor man that thinks Jesus is the answer. Well, to these guys, it obviously was. It attracted his prey. But the point being, when they come in, how are they treated and how much of them get back into the world? And is there any recidivism rate that you've tracked? Because, very frankly, I'm getting tired of hearing people wave that Christian flag and then abuse it all over the place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang up and listen to your answers. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, but uh, earlier you said uh, you are not accepting sex offenders in your program. We do not and haven't for many years. Uh, we just do not have a program uh, intensive enough for convicted sex offenders, even those who've served their time. We don't have facilities to house them in a safe manner, and, and we uh, discontinued the program quite a number of years ago. And is there, are, are there good programs that are workable around the country? We have, I, I believe that we have good outpatient treatment programs. We have very well-trained polygraphers, and we, we put polygraph with the treatment programs uh, to increase the effectiveness. What we don't have and what we, we do need in, in, in Tampa is a residential facility mm -hmm. because uh, if you take a sex offender um, as a high-risk offender to begin with. Mm -hmm. When you have a homeless sex offender, now you really have a very dangerous situation mm -hmm. because you've got all the stressors on top of it and then you have someone that you have less control over. Um, and periodically we do have somebody who's released and has nowhere to go at all. Um, and you know, a homeless shelter is not, is, is not a good situation for that particular kind of offender. Do you want to talk a little bit about a restoration of some of the rights of, of uh, felons, too, like voting and other things? I, I wanted want to, to make one first? really brief point, too, <clears throat> when we're talking about sex offenders. Uh, women who are convicted of prostitution two or more times are sex offenders. See, that's I thought, state, I, thought yeah. I, that's before when I said, isn't it, aren't you... Uh, you just do two times and you've got a problem uh, with... Yeah, I was uh, felonized a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay. 
So there are some things that seem less, um, but less dangerous to the rest of us. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And they get called uh, an sex offender. Sex offenders, too. right? And could they also be called a predator? I don't think. No, I, I've never like heard they of were prostitution times? being no okay. a predator well, crime. Predator is no. pretty okay. high de designation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about some of the uh, some of the other things that. Uh, you want to go to a break? We'll go to a break, and then we'll uh, we'll talk about some of the other things that felons are up against, like maybe restoration of <coughs> rights. We'll be back in just a minute. Plus oxygen equals carbon dioxide. I'd like to pass the back to you now. She's got the drive, the energy, the heart, and the talent. But she wouldn't be here without your help. Please support the United Negro College Fund, because a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Play a game. Let's pretend you own an apartment building and I want to rent from you. I make a good salary, have a good credit history. Would you rent your place to me? How about now? Do you still like me? What if I have an accent or a disability? What if I'm a single parent? Would you steer me away? Would you close the door? Would you? The Fair Housing Act protects your right to live where you want. If you think you've been discriminated against, call us. We're back. Uh, we were talking before the break um, about some of the other issues besides housing, medical, dental, employment. Did I miss one? Uh, mental health, this kind of thing. Um, one of these is, you know, just getting back and being able to vote, for example. Can you comment on that, Elaine? Well, when someone completes their term, we provide them with information. Uh, about restoration of rights because it, that is an incentive. It's one of the incentives to uh, uh, you do well, you complete your sentence, you fulfill all your obligations, and then you're eligible um, to apply for the restoration of your civil rights. So we always provide people information about that. Now, isn't there some referendum or something coming up uh, possibly about in the state of Florida, which is one of only a few states, that doesn't, uh, doesn't recognize doesn't, the rights. The doesn't restore rights to mm -hmm. voting once you've completed your sentence. Isn't, isn't there a, a We also purge it, don't we? Don't we? <laughs> we purge the voter. Didn't we purge the voter uh, rolls? We purged. I watched <laughs> a couple that of times. happen. Uh, yeah, I watched that happen in 2000, uh, right in front of me a few times. Mm -hmm. um, but um, isn't there a proposal right now for us to allow uh, people to vote again in the state of Florida? Yes. And, but, but, but since that's not through right now, what you would have to do, the paperwork, would be to apply and ask again for restoration. Apply to the clemency board and ask for restoration of rights. And what does it take to do that? Is it a big it's deal? A, it, it, it's a completion of an application, and it goes forward to, to the board, um, and then it's reviewed. Um, they come and they, they check documents. Are they mo more than likely to, to give you your rights back or I'm, less likely? I'm not sure because I'm not involved in that portion of it. And it's people who are, have completed supervision that um, apply for it. Yes. Okay. I think it's more difficult, and I know that Representative Joyner has spearheaded that action in Florida here for the last three or four years in the legislature to restore rights. Uh, and, it, and it is 
much more difficult. You do fill out an application and apply to the clemency board, but there seems to be a way to drag their feet and uh, ask for difficult. more information. And I do believe they make it quite difficult in Florida, maybe more than other states. Mm. Okay, you were going to tell me a story about uh, monitoring and, and, and its value. Well, we were talking earlier about sex offenders and mm -hmm. about what kind of supervision and what goes into supervising an offender. Um, and we have a very aggressive uh, program, especially for the sex offenders. Uh, for example, um, we had a case where um, it was a downloading child pornography, what we call the traveler cases, where someone had made an, a, uh, an appointment to travel to meet a young person, somebody underage, uh, but that person underage was actually a federal agent. This person went, went away and came back out after, after a period of, of years and is on supervision, and they're placed in sex offender treatment pr program. They're given polygraph as part of that. And also, usually, if there's a computer involved, we have special conditions for search and special conditions f to restrict their computer access. Uh, in this particular case, um, as a result of a search, we found that an offender had been involved in contacting a young woman. Uh, he had actually, at one point, had ad admitted that he had been on the computer and had talked to a young woman, didn't realize how old she was, and of course ended his contact with her as soon as he realized how old she was. Um, during his revocation, as we were going through the revocation, and we had it with a forensic... We were revoking his We were probation. revoking for, for using the internet and contact with, with a Even minor. Even though he said, I, I stopped right away? Well, we went back and we searched through the computer, and what we found was we found a website for a young woman who was uh, in the eighth grade. In the eighth grade, and so limited that she spelled the name of her elementary school incorrectly. She's from another state, so he's from Florida and she was uh, in Oklahoma. Um, we were able to pull up her web page, see her photograph, contact the school. Her name was not on there, but this, her, her photograph and the name of the school was. Contact the principal. The principal immediately recognized the child and informed us that uh, she was there, that she had recently relocated to that school because there were problems with the, with the parents got the parents involved and found out that her mother had seen her um, using the computer in a way that she felt uncomfortable with, had restricted the, the child. The child then went to her father, her parents were divorced, and said, oh, mommy's being unfair. Mommy won't let me use the computer. I need the computer for school. She ended up moving in with her father. Um, and as a result of the search, the young child ended up in, in treatment. The father realized that his wife's, his ex-wife's, uh, restrictions were, were good and were necessary appropriate. and appropriate, and the offender <clears throat> ended up being reincarcerated. So it there's takes more to play. There's a lot uh, that's involved in trying to supervise this kind of a high risk offender. In that case, um, it was a successful outcome because he had only been online with her. Uh, but it also provides a, a, a reminder Is to all common, of us parents and, and about how. Common, uh, Probate, that's a reminder for parents, but yes. also it's a, and that's a probation vial, uh, it's made um, in part of the sentencing that you cannot y use the computer without some filter or... Well, it depends on, it depends on the case, but yes, in, in, in many cases it's you cannot use the internet at all. Uh, you cannot use an, in, the internet in a, a, a certain manner. In this case, um, he had been using the internet to contact a child. Okay, now we talked about there's another issue, and it's getting your children back. Hmm. Uh, Josette can speak to that. Josette, do you have children? Uh, he's 13. Yes, I have one. You have, that's 13. Mm -hmm. You had this one when you were 12? <laughs> <laughs> you look so Thank young. You. you look so young. You have a 13-year-old, and you had, so tell us your story. Well, luckily, my family cared for him when I was going through everything that I was going through. Um, luckily, he didn't witness a lot of things that were occurring. It was very, very difficult being away from him. And I did, while in Crossroads, there were a few women that had their children taken away with HKI, 
and they would come and visit and it's extremely difficult for them. But I feel that women that are going through those types of issues, treatment programs or what be you, that they need to work on themselves and get their lives together and maybe use the children as, of course, a motivating factor, but need to work on getting themselves together before, they have to be able to take care of themselves before they can take care of their children. Want to add to that, yeah. Sarah? Yeah, and I, I think that is a, a big motivator for us. We do have parenting classes. We are an approved HKI visitation site at our women's program. We're one of the only treatment programs in the state that accepts pregnant women. They can actually bring their babies back to the house with them if they haven't completed their six months by the time they give birth. In fact, we had three babies this month, all very healthy, and moms are doing well. Um, but the children, I think, are a huge motivator. I know in, in Josette's case, um, her son was, was uh, a big reason why I believe she succeeded. He was, um, he was waiting for his mom to come home, and I think that was a huge help, and it is to many of our women. Um, we deal with drug dependency court a lot, and where people have lost their children because they have drug and alcohol problems, and the judge says, you're not getting your kids back until you get your life straightened out and, and um, uh, make better choices for your family. And in that case as well, the, the people agree to enter, the women agree to enter our program specifically so they can regain custody of their children. Uh, so I think helping women regain custody of their children is a huge benefit for our community as well because the children, if you're not fortunate to have family members to step in and help you, they become um, uh, they go into HKI, the they go into the foster system, <coughs> they get shuffled around, you know, they're they don't understand what's going on, uh, and for the most part, their lives are dramatically changed forever. So to help uh, the women do everything they can and motivate them to regain their own children and bring them back into their family in a healthy environment, I think is a huge benefit to everyone. Last week when we were doing a show on the status, a commission on the status of women in Hillsborough County, uh, they had brought with them a... Uh, um, a researcher from uh, the Florida MHI, uh, Mental Health Institute, MHI, yeah. and, and they talked about when the kids get into the foster care program, on average, they're there 48 months, which... It's frightening. That's phenomenal. That's just a phenomenal amount of time in a small, you know, child's life. And they may have moved uh, around a number of times, and I forgot what the number was, but that's fantastic. So. Uh, so this reuniting, they are permitted to uh, reunite with their children if they're successful in the Crossroads program. And what about with your program? How does that work? Well, it's many of the same issues. Um, when women are incarcerated, their children suffer. There's no question that it is difficult on children when women are incarcerated. It, I think that it, it creates particularly difficult issues. The, the women are much more... Uh, it's much more involved working with women than it is with men because of the child care issues. But believe it or not, we're down to four minutes. So I'm going to say, let's take a minute apiece here in case we miss something that we think, you know, you think the viewers should know about. And uh, why don't we start with you, Josette? Um, just for anyone that is going through any type of drug addiction or just making bad choices, there is help for you and not to give up on yourself. You know, that there are people that you can turn to and there is a better way of life. And find them. Definitely. Find them. Go look. And they're there. You just have to go. look for them. You have to go Definitely. look. Definitely. They are not going to knock on your door. Mm -hmm. you got to go do mm -hmm. something. Take, like, one step. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. How about you, Elaine? On the website, www.usprobation.com, there is also a section on the legal consequences of being involved in drug use and being involved with people who use or traffic in, in drugs. We do community outreach for uh, teenagers and for youth groups, um, and we're willing to send folks out all over, all over the yeah, area. There was something interesting right there. It said uh, there was a question on there Fed on facts. your website, mm -hmm. and it said uh, if you know about a felony and you don't report it to the authorities, which one of these things do you think apply? You could be on probation for a year or go to jail and use fines. And I picked the wrong thing because... There's a lot of terrific information in FedFacts. It's well, based on real cases and there, 
things, just the issues of what is a conspiracy and what are the elements of a conspiracy. You don't have to tr touch the drugs. You don't have to actually make any money on the drugs. You can, it could be fake drugs, and you can still have criminal culpability. Our children need to know this so that well, they website, can make good choices. Right, we keep hearing about good choices. Your website had a great uh, glossary on there, mm -hmm. plus these answers, which, by the way, if you do know a felony and you didn't, didn't tell the report it, it's called this prison of a felony. That's what it's called. You could go to jail for three, mm -hmm. up to three years and be fined $250,000. That's a ton of money. Okay, another minute. Um, as I said earlier, Crosser has been around for a very long time in the community uh, serving this population. We spend, both in Florida and nationally, 40% more money to incarcerate and house nonviolent offenders than we do to educate the public. Uh, this year, there is a bill before the uh, Florida legislature to uh, cut funding 25% across the board in the state of Florida for rehabilitation beds. I would encourage anyone who has uh, time to make a comment to your legislators to encourage them because of people like Josette. Josette is now a working taxpayer. She has custody of her own child. She's raising her son. She's not a burden on our taxpayers. And we have many, many success stories. It's, it's worth rehabilitation. It's right worth then. it. Okay, so everybody needs to go investigate that and uh, make sure that we put the, the uh, money and the support behind helping people help themselves. I want to thank uh, Carol and Elijah and Charles and Raul and David and Dan and, of course, Mary for getting the show on the air. And uh, I do hope that you'll tune in uh, next time. I think we're doing Women's Health. Uh, as we do in March, we do a lot of women's topics, and I uh, appreciate your tuning in. Thanks so much. Come on down, take our training, put on programming yourself. Good night. Thank you.